a country left in chaos and disrepair after a massive civil war known as the North-South Conflict has started to wind down. The Cement Committee stepped into the conflict to negotiate a ceasefire between the two sides. Both sides withdrawing their troops created a power vacuum and multiple factions and groups have popped up and taken control over certain regions and areas of the country. This is the premise to Arena Breakout, a mobile immersive tactical first person shooter game. Grab some food and a drink, sit back and relax as I cover the backstories of characters, maps, and lore found across Arena Breakout. This war-torn fictional country is known as Kimona. Set in a fictional world, Kimona is a shell of what it used to be, once thriving with urban cities that now seem to be left unpopulated by anyone who isn't taking advantage of the crisis. Let's go over some of the cities and towns seen around the country of Kimona. Let's start with the map of Farm. A quiet farming town located just to the southwest of Armory, it's a supply depot for Renoir, more specifically the motel and stables. He sent one of his top commanders, Ajax, to take control over the area. Move into Armory. Armory is a heavily fortified military base to the northeast of Farm. Once controlled by the Northern Front, during the North-South conflicts, Ajax held the area. Once Renoir showed up, he sent Ajax to take control over Farm, and Renoir took control of Armory. Far north of Farm, in the foothills of the Anatos mountain range, this area is controlled by Fred after he discovered opportunities that could lead to riches. Featuring a hotel built on a reservoir that overlooks a small village with a dam that supplies electricity to the surrounding areas. This area is called Northridge. Valley. Valley was once a popular tourist destination. After several wars, it is no longer viable as a tourist attraction. When the North and South negotiated the ceasefire, Doss, a local gangster, returned from overseas and settled here. His men patrolled the area around factory in the seaside villa. Port. Located in the Guayapos Bay region east of Armory, an important import and export channel for northern Kimona. During the time it was under control by the Northern Front, the Tavellans dispatched military to support the building of a naval port and shipyard for repairs of the ships. Kimona TV Station is located in the Guarapos region north of Port. During the North-South Conflict, it was used by the Northern Front as a frontline command center. For unknown reason, after the Dark Zone was established, the Cement Committee commandeered the TV station. The majority of the building was destroyed, with only the interior left intact during the war. Let's go over some of the characters' backstories, starting off with Joel Garrison. Joel was a middle school teacher who joined the local militia after losing his relatives in the war. After the war, Joel found himself unable to return to ordinary life, so he left his hometown and became an operator. In the later years of the North-South Conflict, he was recruited by Black Gold Universal and was active as a squad captain in Kimona. During one operation, Joel was ambushed and his squad suffered heavy losses. Following this incident, he chose to quit Black Gold Universal. After recuperating for six months, he then returned to Kimona in a different role, providing training and intermediary services for operators. Avita was born in one of the southern nations of the Ocean Alliance. Her family background is unknown. She graduated as a doctor of medicine from the Colum State Medical College and joined Doctors Without Borders during her PhD. After the outbreak of the North-South Conflict, Avita arrived in Kimona as a medic and carried out fundraising to establish a temporary medical clinic that provided services for both locals and operators. She is said to have come to Kimona to find her father, a medical expert who disappeared some months ago, and she is currently commissioning operators to collect clues. Deke Vinson Deke Vinson was born in Kimona to a family active in its various circles. During his studies in Colum, a firm resolution sprouted within him, which left him feeling strongly dissatisfied with the situation in Kimona. When the North-South conflict broke out, Deke took the opportunity to return home. He used his family's influence and connections to navigate various channels of underground trade, and accumulated a lot of wealth with his business acumen and clever methods. This allowed him to make acquaintances in various factions and become a highly sought-after intelligence trader, but Deke's ambitions reach even farther. Vladin, a native of Tavella, originally served as an operations expert in a special airborne regiment of his own nation. 
After making great achievements in a local battle, he secretly joined the Tavellan Security Department. Shortly after the North-South conflict broke out, the Northern Security Union provided assistance to the Northern Front and Vladim was sent there as a military observer. After the clan leader led Renoir and others to break away from the Northern Front, the operation was forced to a halt and the second clan was disbanded. Thereafter, Vladin continued to lead the intelligence work of the Northern Front as Special Commissioner, safeguarding the interests of the Northern Security Union and the Gung Nir plan after the Semek. Thomas Edward, who once served in a special tactical squadron of the Column Air Force, is currently a senior intelligence officer in the Overseas Secret Service of the Column Defense Intelligence. He has been stationed overseas for a long time collecting intelligence. A few years after the Semek crisis, Thomas was posted to Kimona and later played an important role in the North-South conflict. After the Semek committee intervened in the war, Thomas was appointed as one of their military mediators in Kimona. Randall Fisher once served in a special forces unit of the Ocean Alliance. After retiring, he joined the Black Gold Universal Operator Organization. As a frontline combatant, he participated in local battles in various regions. After the outbreak of the North-South conflict, he was stationed in Kimona as a local commander and head of operations. Randall mainly undertakes commissions from the Ocean Alliance and the Column Defense Intelligence Service. He has many business dealings with Thomas, but the two of them don't seem to trust each other. Rodriguez, formerly a captain with the Guayapos Fisheries, chose to stay behind at the fisheries when the North-South conflict broke out. During the chaos of those years, he was in contact with various factions, and his network of relationships spread all over the Dark Zone. They disguised themselves as fishermen while secretly carrying out underground business. But as the blockade of Kimona by Semek forces Stein, Rodriguez's retail business became greatly affected. As business in the port started expanding, he also gave up his smaller scale endeavors. Coming out of the contacts and moving to the bosses, the first boss we have is Anthony Renoir. During the North-South Conflict, he was the commander of the 4th Infantry Brigade and was Ajax's superior. He left with Ajax when the commander of the 2nd Clan declared independence along with many others of the Northern Front. His boss token being the Battleforge Badge which he earned from his time being in the military, but it no longer symbolizes glory to him. Ajax Jones, one of Renoir's officers during the North-South Conflicts. Ajax once watched over Armory. After the second clan disbanded, Renoir returned to Armory. For Ajax, approval from those in power is far more important than even good equipment. He was given a pocket knife and made a commander in Renoir's forces. Now being given the recognition and power he craved, he declared his allegiance. He was then sent to farm by Renoir to take control. His boss token is the knife given to him by Renoir. Anthony Doss, a local gangster who lives in luxury at the seaside villa. During the north-south conflict, Doss was overseas. When the North and South negotiated a ceasefire, Doss, with the help of his partners, returned to Valley to resume the family business of dealing weapons and <laughs> his boss token being a handmade gold coin that appears ancient, with engravings covered in signs of where he holds it every day, feeling the power and authority he's taken. Derwin Pan, Northern Front Navy Captain and first mate of the ship Polaris. When the second clan disbanded, the Polaris's Captain Carl decided to sink the ship, which was under repairs at the shipyard in port, and returned to the North. Derwin defied the orders and subsequently took over the ship and port. He is a force to be reckoned with in the eastern seas of the Dark Zone. He's worked with the contact Rodriguez to establish a thriving black market trade, during which time he became good friends with Doss. Derwin's boss token is a streamer cut from a military cap. Fred Lee, a former agent who decided to work alone after discovering the rich opportunities in Northridge. A skilled veteran, possibly from Kimona's military. However, he currently appears to be allied with the White Wolf Squad, a faction related to the Tavella Petroleum Company. Let's go over some of the lore hidden in the gameplay mechanics. The elite guards that spawn on farm wear the same armor types as those seen on Armory, which makes sense seen as Ajax works for Renoir and would be supplied armor from the Armory. The majority of Rodriguez's missions are on Valley, him being the middleman between Doss and Derwin. This could be the dealings he does for Doss, making us accomplices with Doss in a way. You can see the damage the war has caused in many of the maps, such as the collapsed bridge on farm and the damaged buildings on port, as well as bunkers and artillery guns on Valley. Here's a couple of secrets and easter eggs you may or may not have known about Arena Breakout. 
One, Nortino Court added in season four to Valley is the contact Rodriguez's family home. Two, there are pigeons you can shoot in game, but it's a rare sight to see because they are realizing that this barren area in the center of the peninsula is impassable to them. Bots on port can sit down claymores, meaning they are in the game files, and the boss, Kurt, on TV station can throw C4, which can be heard by the distinct ticking noise it makes. The ship Polaris, which Derwin was first mate on, can be seen in the map port. The impact of lore on gameplay. Much like Tarkov, when you die in Arena Breakout, you lose everything you bring in, which causes a lot of survival versus humanity situations, making it hard to make friends in game. Players may be forced into choosing between survival or humanity, highlighting the moral dilemma of self-preservation and altruism. Conclusion From an aid worker looking for clues about her father's whereabouts, to a former Navy captain working with a local war criminal, Arena Breakout has some very interesting and crazy lore to say the least. You just have to know where to find it. Speaking of which, this is where the community can help out and get involved. While you're out in your raids, getting secret documents and thermals off of other operators, keep your eye out for the hidden lore and lore placed in plain sight to help grow what we know about the lore of Arena Breakout. This is the first video I've done in this format. If you've enjoyed the style of content, be sure to leave a like and a subscribe to show your support for my channel. See you guys in the next video. Peace.